Again, my name is Pedro Leonardo and I'm a product manager with Cisco. I look after the uh, management of um, routing platforms, so network management across the board, and also plug and play. So um, as we already uh, showed you before, we have the uh, plug and play, right? The ability to take uh, a small portion of um, a config to get the router to um, call home, connect to the controller and get provision. Uh, and we mentioned before that uh, this can be done over a USB stick as the router powers up. The USB stick it calls onto the controller. We're also delivering a, a, the, the other option where you don't need anything, where the router will go to the Cisco cloud, discover the controller via the Cisco smart account, and then show up in the controller. Can it be behind a NAT device? It can. It can. It can. Yeah. Because this is a call home, so it's the device that initially initiates the connection to the controller, and then after that, then we can, the controller can connect to the device. Um, the second step. You said you're working on the part for connecting to the Cisco cloud, and then it, it goes out from there. That's right. Okay. That's right. And that will be a completely like Meraki like model where the devices show up immediately in your uh, dashboard. So if I order from the factory today, what, what am I actually getting? If I'm getting a zero touch uh, so, router so from the factory. Exactly. So today you do have to, um, uh, the router is not able to go to the cloud and identify the location of your controller right. automatically. So we do have to get the USB stick. So you save this in a file on a USB stick. You put the USB stick on the box as the box puts up. So, so, so that's me as the IT operations person I'm doing that? Right. Right. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. The person on site does not need to know have any skills at all networking because they don't need to go to any console, anything. It's just cables, USB stick, power. That's all it's needed there. But, but the, the, the true ZTP is coming, right? Or, or right. The cloud redirected, uh, so we are starting that in October, uh, where it's like the Meraki model. Uh, for that, there's additional components, right? Uh, as you understand, on the Cisco sales model, uh, as we sell a device, usually goes through a partner, like a provider, a system integrator, right? So there, there is a need to have the um, uh, transfer of ownership. So the partner needs to transfer the ownership on the Cisco uh, smart account to say that these devices with these serial numbers belong to a certain customer. After that, the device, the router or the switch, can go to the smart account and identify the controller of that specific customer based on the, the order that the customer made. So similar to what we are doing with Meraki. And then it will show up on the map. And then it will come up to the controller and shows up in a map. We have a table view or we have a map view. Uh, map view, uh, it's easier for you to find. If I want to find something here, I have a site here in uh, San Francisco, uh, for, for example. It's easy for me to go and identify and find the site and see what's going on. Or is it all, all good? Or um, So I can quickly come and find my sites here um, on the network, right? So this is, uh, again, um, it's the ability for us to get the devices easily online and uh, start monitoring and see the progress as we are provisioning and updating them as well. Does so this have to be a separate part number to, like, with the, with the cloud control, without the cloud control? No, it's the same part number. It's additional optional. So we do want to provide customers with different options. Um, some customers actually don't like cloud or don't like USB stick. They actually want to go the traditional way. Others are more comfortable with that model. So we have providing, like, Depends on the level of, let's say, flexibility that you want, uh, where you, how far you want to go, right? A lot of customers in different regions, they are actually not uh, okay with having uh, cloud options at all. So we have uh, other options in that case. But you'd have to have some kind of programming in the router for it to tell it to do that. Right, so out, out of the box, the router will always read from USB stick. If it's from factory, it's clean, there's nothing there. It will do that out of the box, right? Second option is it will do a DHCP discovery on the, on the WAN port, like a Meraki or any other device. So it will try to discover a local network. You do have another option, which is to populate. Since you're asking questions, I can give you a few more options. Um, that is the option of actually getting the device to, um, to ask for a configuration um, uh, from, um, from a, a local DHCP server. So if I'm a service provider, I actually own my own DHCP server. So I can populate option uh, for 
uh, 43 or 60 in my local DHCP server. So as the device power, powers up, then the device discovers the, uh, the controller automatically. So you don't need to go anywhere else. It's all there locally on that uh, environment. Like for a switch, that's usually how you deploy a switch. You manipulate your local DHCP server or like a phone, right? Uh, an IP phone, traditionally you discover on a network, identify the call manager and go to the call manager. So it's the same process. We also have a free application on handheld devices that's available. I didn't mention that because I mean, we do have multiple, we understand that everyone likes options, right? Like uh, anything, right? We do have a handheld application where you connect a handheld device, a smartphone to the console, and then the phone goes to the router, puts the config, validates the serial uh, number, goes to the controller via the LTE, HTTPS, grabs the config. It can also do additional troubleshooting. If you think there is a need to have additional troubleshooting or have like instructions, for the installer, say for this device, this is how you actually connect it. You can actually use a tablet or a smartphone and tell the, the, the person on site how to install it. So we have additional options. The USB stick or the cloud are the easiest one that everyone will be more familiar with. That's why we mentioned those as a, like a first option. And you have to have smart accounts set up. For the cloud uh, redirect, we do, um, because otherwise we cannot know where the controller is for the specific customer. On the Meraki case, because all of the devices go to the same cloud, then it's one single cloud for everyone, right? So it's when devices know where to call home because there's only one place. On the case of a, a traditional where you have your own controller on-prem, then we have to first identify where the controller is. What is the customer? So this is the, the, the piece of doing the, um, getting the sites online and seeing the sites to easily uh, troubleshoot, monitor, and identify the, the devices. Another piece that I want to show you here is how we uh, typically set up our um, um, aggregation. So as Sumant mentioned, we have a typical uh, border uh, routers here where we deploy the technologies, our uh, the MVPN and all of the QoS, PFR. So all of the technology is there for IWAN. Uh, the way we define it here on the GUI is that we want to make it more intuitive and easy. So the idea is that the admin does not need to know details about CLI at all. I'm not asking anything about how to configure the MVPN and QoS and PFR, all of those features, right? It's just a, a higher level GUI on how I design, let's say, this is my data center. I identify my providers, my aggregation, my border uh, routers, my master controller. It's all defined centrally on the GUI, and this gets propagated. And then after that, I add my sites. So this is how easy it is here to uh, set up my sites here in, in this network, right? On my MPLS side, I, we do have the preloaded class models for service providers. As we know, there are, and this logged out, and there are, um, typical um, five, six, eight class model, right, for a service provider. So based on that, we uh, preload the controller with the traditional, with the most classic ways of doing QoS from a service provider perspective, right? If you are familiar with a way a provider will do the QoS, so this is all available here out of the box. So now that's available there, you can, again, customize it. You don't have to, again, to go to any CLI at all. You can customize everything on a GUI. Uh, and then you make a selection of your own custom uh, class model that you want to use there. So this is from an aggregation perspective, right? This is one model. Um, if you do have multiple ones, instead of uh, one data center, if you have multiple uh, data centers, we have also um, a way for you to go and design your uh, data center. So let's say that we have three data centers here, and I have, um, let's say, two boxes in this one, and I have another one here. So I can, you see, very quickly design the number of pops that I have in my data center and then identify a provider. Like someone was asking, can I have more than one or two providers? Let's say that I have four providers, right? I see my providers and then I just start connecting my data centers to my providers easily, quickly, right? So again, no CLI, nothing. I can quickly design my network and usually go to a customer and say, let me do a, a whiteboard. I have this data, data center, this data center, and these providers. And you can design this on a whiteboard in five minutes. So we are doing the same, but your whiteboard is now the controller. So we build kind of your whiteboard tool there. 
So it's more like a question driven thing. So we will, more like how we file the taxes using TurboTax. We ask you the right data and then we actually build the network. They actually give you the taxes, but they, we, we actually build the network by asking the right questions. How many data centers that you have? How many routers that we have? From there on, we'll let you build it. Please go ahead. Uh, what about virtual routers? Is I1 supported in uh, um, on uh, CSR 1KV, for example? I'm glad you actually asked that virtual question because uh, one of the most important things is uh, the, the solution or the outcomes doesn't matter in how you consume it, right? It's the same thing, hybrid van that you are enabling, whether you are doing physical or virtual. So the first thing what we have today is we obviously we have full physical support and we have uh, uh, part virtual, which is like uh, your services like uh, WAS uh, and Akamai Caching, VWAS can actually move to a uh, UCSC server. And the, and the third aspect is we can do a full virtual using the CSR aspect of it. So we, today you can actually run the master controller on a separate uh, data center, right? So you can actually do that. And going forward, you will have a full virtual support even on the forwarding engine, right? Well, but like for, for a branch router, if I've got small branch and they want to use a virtual router there instead of hardware, uh, I mean, is that supported? Yeah, that is supported with a, with a, with a Vantage device. So it's like a more more like a Vantage device on what you do. It has even without even IVAN. Okay, can you run a CSR today? Yes, you can run a CSR today. Two questions, real quick, actually. Please. Already mentioned on the DevNet zone online that APIC EM says it's in beta. So you know, is it is it shipping? That's the first question. And two is I'm you know I've seen demos of APIC EM going back maybe you know two years. Totally not related to, to IWAN, right? For QS management, ACL management, Correct. and is Correct. that still an option as well yes. to use APIC EM? Yeah. So, so two, two things that I want to address. So your first question is, uh, when is it shipping on the, so it, it has been in field trials, I think 100 plus customers are actually uh, downloaded it and are actually using it. And APIC EM is, uh, the way how I look at it is like an iOS platform, right? You can run any app that you want. So before IWAN app, there were easy calls and there are certain ACL apps and path visualization and so on and so forth. So customers are actually trying that uh, those things out, different parts of the APIC EM. So you will have different apps uh, on top to of it. You pick which app you want to run on which It's really instance. what is the problem uh, that you are trying to solve. So the base APIC EM platform is actually free. And then depending upon if you are doing WAN orchestration, then you will go with IWAN app. You will just download the IWAN app and you have everything that you need in the IWAN app and you will do the WAN orchestration. If you are doing something on the switching side, <laughs> visualizing on the switching side, you will just load that particular app to do on your campus management and so on. On a separate APIC EM? No, on the same APIC okay. EM. So the, one of the things on the left side that Pedro actually showed you, uh, uh, on the left bar, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is symbols actually listed out. They, they actually present different, uh, uh, different apps on this thing. Got it. So there is no separate APIC EM. There is only one APIC EM you can run the apps that you need, right? And, and in you, theory, the different apps can access the same device for yes, management. Okay. Yeah, you will, have, you will have the same apps, one platform, and depending upon your need, you, will, you can start with Campus and then go to WAN, or you can start with WAN and then go to Campus okay. and route the right apps. We th think about it like a platform, like you have like a laptop, like Windows or um, Apple, right? You have the platform with their own, let's say, libraries and uh, folders and files, and then you can have different file, like applications that can use all of those files that are available there in the same. So we are doing kind of the same here. Uh, whereas like the files in this case would be your devices, and then you have whatever application to deal with those uh, files that in the system. And the idea being is that Cisco is building a lot of applications, but we, uh, because this is an open architecture, we'll have also third-party applications, and a lot of customers actually want to do automation. So they want to use the controller as like one node in their, let's, let's say, larger network management, because you might want to do fulfillment, you have a little like service providers, uh, do a lot of like fulfillment uh, activities where you get the devices via plug and play, you define a template, you automate, so you can build a lot of automation around this. Or if you, in the case of IOM, we are building the full, let's say, end-to-end -end lifecycle management for IOM within the controller, so you can leverage that. So it's flexible in the sense that you can take what we have, expand, work with others, and uh, do more. How about high availability for the APIC EM? So APIC EM will have uh, high availability, so, uh, high availability uh, in what is called a, a multi, um, 
multi-device and multi-service. Okay. So think about having multiple systems where one can be in the long location, other in another location, or if possible, let's say, in the, in the cloud hosted environment. And you take a service, for example, plug and play as a service, and you can instantiate that services in multiple hosts. Okay. So if one breaks, you have the second one. Also for doing upgrades, we want the upgrades to be seamless. So we are in the journey of letting customers trust the, our ability to do a complete, let's say, uh, upgrade and management. Like if you look at your laptops today, you know that there are updates from your Apple or Microsoft, they happen on the background and you don't really have to deal with it because you already trust them, right? So we want to go to the same model where our controller will be your trust system. The controller will be able to auto-update itself uh, when it's needed for critical fixes and then the services will be spawned. So we have the services, you update one service, uh, shut down the other one, so it becomes a seamless upgrade. So it's both from a high availability from like a normal op operation, but also from a perspective of then doing a seamless upgrade where the services don't break in the middle. Just just to add on that, one fundamental uh, difference is yes, the Epic EM uh, uh, model will have high availability built into the system, but it more goes back to our design principle in terms of what are the functions that we are actually centralizing it, right? So when uh, that's why I said when the policy enforcement is coming from from the distributed system, uh, so or a key exchange is distributed, that means a controller, no matter how much availability redundancy that you built into that, if something happens to that, you are still your business function or your business, there is still business continuity into the system. So that really goes back not just on adding uh, the backup devices, but also what if everything goes down, what is, what is your strategy? Is the business continuing or not? If you have a distributed system, if you actually distribute these key functions in the network, then you can continue your business, right? 